Lords. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear, yea, indeed, but understand not, and see, yea, indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. So Isaiah comes to this moment in his prophetic career where he's commissioned, where he's called. Now, no doubt he had been used by God before this moment and up until this moment in his life because he was consecrated to the Lord and he set his life apart for the Lord and also his, his family's life, naming his children uh, very specific names to speak of specific things, so on and so forth. So he was just a very godly man, consecrated to the Lord and the Lord's purposes up until this point. But this is where he receives his commission, his call, his, his distinct call upon his life. Um, and this is very vital, I think, for all of us, because the Lord does indeed call us all. Um, and, and uh, you know, he's going to speak to your heart, to my heart, uh, personally, individually, privately. Um, he might uh, lead you into a certain uh, area of giftedness and calling and me into another area of giftedness and, and calling. And we are to acknowledge all of those areas of giftedness and callings in the body of Christ because we, we need everything. We need the neck, we need the feet, we need the toes, the hands, the elbows, the eyes. We need every part. And we don't want to think that one part of the body is not necessary. Um, we might not realize all the parts of the body are there all the time, but we have to acknowledge the fact that all parts of the body are necessary for the body to be healthy. For instance, I don't normally think of my big toes. They're just there. I don't normally think about them, though. But they're there. And I'm very thankful when I do think of them that they're still there. I need them. They help me balance. They help me run. They help me walk. I'm sure you could manage without them, but it would be really uncomfortable. And so I'm thankful for them. Uh, but it's one of those less seen, less known, forgotten kind of areas that's there, that's very necessary, and yet we forget about it sometimes. So I, I think we, we have to recognize that God has a call for all of us. And some of our callings are going to be more quiet and more, you know, kind of secluded than others. And that's okay, because God has a place for all of us, and we need to find what that place is. If we, try to, if we, if we think that only certain places in the body of Christ matter to God, and those other kind of inconsequential places or those other kind of hidden places of service which nobody sees or, or knows of or acknowledges, they're not that important. No, that, that's really backward. That's really backward. Um, we, we have to understand that, that God, he has a call upon all our lives. This is when Isaiah was called. And he gives us the timing. Isaiah, or excuse me, Uzziah, he died at 740 B.C., so this is roughly around that time. It says in the year that he died. It doesn't say the day he died. 
So it was around the time of his death. Probably commentators say a little bit before. But anyway, it was imminent. It was known. And we all know how he died, because we read in Second Chronicles, we read in the Kings as well, how he died. He died of leprosy. He was struck of leprosy. He was a very good king, a very godly king. And he took the throne in Judah at 16 years of age. 16 years he became king, and he was a very godly, good king, although he did allow the, you know, the groves to exist still, and people were still worshiping idols, and he didn't put that down entirely. Nonetheless, he himself personally walked before the Lord all the days. And as long as he was walking before the Lord, it, says, it tells us clearly in Chronicles that as long as he was walking with the Lord, the Lord prospered him. And the Lord definitely prospered Uzziah. He had a standing military of over 300,000 men prepared for battle, and he had 2,500 uh, special forces to lead those troops. And they were always ready to go out to war, and he expanded the territory of Israel very far beyond uh, what it was previous to his kingship. Uh, he was known all the way down, even as far as Egypt, and people feared Israel greatly in his time, would not so much as lift their head to them, uh, and so he was a very mighty, very, very prospering king, a very godly king. He created uh, engines, it says, uh, of, of war in Chronicles, meaning equipment. He created new kinds of, of battlement and equipments to uh, be more effective in battle and to incre increase the might of Israel. And, and so he was very, very, very good king for Israel. But somehow, <laughs> in his later years, he was lifted up in pride, and he thought he can go into the temple and offer sacrifices at the altar of incense. And he went in there with a censer, and he started burning incense. And I think it says something like 80 priests went in there to stop him and to rebuke him for what he did. And he got angry, and he lifted up the hand with the censer in it at the priests, and then the Lord struck him with leprosy. And he remained in a leprous state, in a, it says, in a several house. And his son was co-regent, kind of leading very practically, even though he was still king, he had to be separated because of, the, because of the leprosy. And he remained that way until his death. So very sad, very, very uh, horrible way to, to go. 52 years he was king. 52 years. Uh, it, it would be awesome, in my opinion, it would be so awesome to have a godly king, a godly president, a godly whatever, whatever kind of government you have, uh, for 52 years. I mean, up until his last years, at least. And it's not that when, when you know, he went and he made that mistake, he, he failed miserably and the Lord rebuked him severely. He, got, he was leprous, but he, he didn't turn his back on the Lord. He still worshipped the Lord. He, he always worshipped the Lord. I mean, this is, this is, to me, like su such a, a blessing to have such leadership for such a length of time. Man, no wonder why Isaiah was distraught in this moment. As anybody would be, when good leadership goes, you wonder, well, who's coming in next? And what's going to happen? For, think, think of 52 years relying upon good, godly leadership, and then suddenly gone, at least from the public eye, because he was rebuked for his sin, and then he stayed in that place of seclusion until his death. What a sorrowful thing. What, what a horrible thing. And what a, what a maybe frantic moment for people wondering, what's going to happen to us now? We were looking to him. Now, here we have a very important lesson for us, that we cannot put our trust in man. I think it's, was it already... Um, Back in chapter 2, verse, verse, verse 22. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? In other words, don't put your trust in man. His life is in his nostrils. In other words, one breath. He's one breath away from death. That's it. So why trust in man? Even, even if it's a, a reliable, diligent, faithful, God-loving, God-fearing man, your trust must remain in God, always. Because even the godliest of men or women 
will disappoint you, will fail, because they are still just men and women. They are men and women of like passions. And given the right opportunity and, and you know, perhaps just being lifted up in a moment of pride, they will just go headlong into sin and become a supreme disappointment. And I've, I've experienced this personally. And it is disappointing. And it brings heartache and it brings tears. But every time it's happened, the Lord has come right in and proven himself faithful and reminded me how important it is not to look to man to sustain you, but to look to God. So important. So this was a good lesson for not only Isaiah, especially Isaiah, because he was, he was now being prepared by God for a very difficult calling. And we'll point out why it was a difficult calling in a little bit. But he was being prepared by God for a very difficult calling. So he needed this. He needed to, this lesson was huge for him to really keep his eyes on the Lord. But for every child of Israel in that time, especially the southern kingdom Judah, and for us today, what an important lesson to learn. Um, Psalm 146, you don't have to turn there, I could read it to you, says this. Um, <clears throat> Put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returns to his earth, in that very day, his thoughts perish. And then the last verse of that chapter says this, um, Psalm 146. Um, I just lost my place. What just happened to my Bible? So I, just, I just turned the page on myself. Okay, and then the last verse. The Lord, though, shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Don't put your trust in man. He won't reign forever, but the Lord will. The Lord will never be dethroned. The Lord will never be dethroned. And he'll never disappoint. He'll never fail. He'll never have to backpedal and try to explain what he meant and say, well, I, I'm sorry I said it that way. I didn't mean to offend you. Or, you know, whoops, I didn't notice you were there. I pff, kind of forgot about you. It's sorry that happened to you. He never has to say whoops. He never has, has to apologize for anything. He never makes mistakes. He's perfect in his, all, all of his ways, and he's absolutely faithful to us. Now, it's in this year, though, that Uzziah dies, that Isaiah then sees the Lord. And sometimes God has to remove our Uzziahs so that we can see the Lord. And like I said, if it, it's, it's happened to me. It's happened to me more than once. I've had several Uzziahs in my life. Uh, my mom was one such person in my life. And the Lord took her home. I had a mentor very early on who discipled me, spent tons of time with me. And when I was in Europe uh, at Bible college, he constantly called me. When I was here in Finland, he constantly called me, kept track of me. And uh, he's now with the Lord. And every time, my, I mean, it's amazing. And, uh, total heartbreak, total, you know, feeling like a sense of loss. But actually what you do is you gain because you, now you, you have a, a, a more direct view of the Lord. And we all need that. We all need that. There's a couple things that we must be careful of as Christians. To make other people in our lives like Uzziah was for Isaiah. We have to be careful of that. To not look to Uzziah's, but to look to the Lord. And listen, please, listen. You mustn't ever, ever be a Uzziah for someone else. You mustn't ever be that for somebody else. If you find that somebody is looking to you too much, trusting in you too much, constantly calling you for everything and every little thing that happens in their life, wondering what you think and what you should do and all this stuff... You need to distance yourself from that person, and you need to simply tell them, just go and pray. God will take care of you. Go look to the Lord. Dive into the Psalms. Dive into the Word of God. Dive into the prayer. Go to your closet, man. Why, do you, why are you calling me? Because the best that any of us can ever do is really just point people to the Lord. And if you become that place in someone's life, let me tell you something, God's going to need to remove you. <laughs> He's going to need to remove you. It might be painful. He'll do whatever it takes, though, to get the undivided attention of his child. He doesn't want any. There's only one mediator in between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. 
And no one else must stand in between us and God but him. He represents us to the Father, no one else. We go in to the presence of God in prayer based on the merits of Christ, not on some Uzziah. And we have open, free communion and fellowship based on the merits of Christ and what he accomplished at the cross of Calvary. We fully depend and lean on that solely and we go to God on our own as his child. Not as a grandchild, but a child. It doesn't matter who your quote-unquote spiritual father may be. You know, as Paul even called himself a father, spiritually speaking. And rightfully so. But he was not trying to take a, a place of, you know, to be the Christ in, 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 in between that person and, and God. No, that's not. uh And we must be careful of those two things. Looking to Uzziah's and being a Uzziah. Okay? Glad we cleared that up. <laughs> but notice here, he sees the Lord, and I love this. How is the Lord? He's sitting. He sees the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And by the way, this is a very important chapter in the process of the book of Isaiah because you have the first five chapters really have been general. We've seen very general themes of judgment and salvation, but with no real specific historical context around those general themes of judgment and salvation. And then there's this incredible promise in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, of salvation to come one day. And for this incredible work to be done one day in the people of God who are currently backslidden. And, and one must ask, well, how is this process of revival in God's people to happen? The answer is in chapter 6, because the process occurs in Isaiah, who himself identifies with the whole nation. And so the answer is found in chapter 6. When we get to chapter 7 through uh, 12, we find very uh, specific um, moments of judgment tied to specific moments in history. So we get the historical context. Uh, for, for example, uh, we learn in chapter 6 of some judgments that are to come. One of the judgments to come was a hardening of the people's heart and understanding to the words of God that were being prophesied through Isaiah the prophet. And we see that played out directly in chapter 7 with Ahaz's response to Isaiah and his words. Um, then in chapters 7 through 11, again, we find that the, the nation is going to be judged and judged and judged and whittled down basically until 11 verse 1 where it says that it's going to bring the people of God down to a stump. You're, you were this tree, but I'm going to bring you down to a stump till there's almost nothing left. But from that stump will come life, will come revival. And we see in chapter 6 at the end also this, this remnant, this tenth that God spares, that he'll bring back life from that remnant, once again in the nation. And again, so the, the, the specific kind of historical context around these moments of uh, judgment and revival and salvation and such, they will be hereafter. But as I've been saying all along, I believe the first five chapters are, are kind of like a preface to, to Isaiah's whole book, and he's kind of telling what the rest of it's going to look like, but now he's going to get into the specifics as far as when these things are going to happen and by what nation is going to come and God's going to use to judge his people. So this is a very important chapter in that sense because Isaiah is going to identify with the nation of Israel and basically say, this is what you must do. What happened to me must happen to you for us as a nation to be right before God. For us as a nation to really be the city on a hill, you know, the candle that's burning brightly for the Lord, we need to go through this process. For God to send us and, and for us to be used by God, we must have this kind of a moment. Israel was far from this in this, in this time. In, the, in this moment of history, they, they were just so far from this. They needed revival. They would have before uh, the southern kingdom was ultimately carried away under Babylon, they would have another moment of revival, but it would be brief, and then it was done. And then God's judgment fell, and they were carried off. So he sees the Lord sitting upon the throne. Amidst all of this turmoil, 
amidst all of the unrest in the people, amidst, amidst all of their faithlessness and backsliddenness and stiff-neckedness, God is sitting. He's not worried. And he's in perfect control. He's on his throne. His posture is one of rest, and his place is place of rule, his throne. He's in control. And that should encourage us, especially looking at the day and age that we live in. I would say, especially for us in Finland, recently, as believers in Finland, I feel it's very interesting to note what's going on in the nation when it comes to religious liberties. I, I find it fascinating how Paivi Rasenen is being basically persecuted for standing up for the word of God. God bless her. She will have reward in heaven. And I pray that there would be a, a million more of Paivi Rasenens to stand up beside her and say, this is nonsense. I, by the way, I, I fully embrace, I fully, I wholeheartedly embrace her views. I think she's got the biblical view. And it is for that that she's being told, you can't say those things. But wait a second, I thought we had free speech. Well, what is free speech unless you can say the good, the bad, and the ugly? There's a lot of things that other organizations say that I hate to hear, but I would never want their freedom to say it be taken away. Because I'd rather live in a free country letting everybody speak their mind because why not just speak out what's already within? God sees it anyway. And then we know how to deal with one another. It's a more honest relationship. But now, even a politician such as Pai Viresen, and who, you know, I don't know if she's actually still in politics, so forgive me if I misspoke, but anyway, she's recognized as a long-term politician in this country. I mean, if she can't speak who represents people, then how can the people speak? That's crazy. And so with, with all of this unrest, we can feel a certain fear, a, a certain trepidation come over us, perhaps, where we aren't as bold as we once were to speak the truth. Because, well, I don't want somebody to report me to the police. Let them report you. If you suffer for God, you will be blessed. God promises that. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy, no doubt. I'm, I'm guessing Pai Virasanen would rather be doing something else. Nevertheless, she is going to be blessed. And everyone else that stands with God and stands with his word and stands upon truth and does not, does not hide the truth uh, is not ashamed of the truth. Let's say it like that. Everyone who stands with God will be blessed. I think we live, but we don't need to fret because God's on his throne. He's not wringing his hands going, oh, well, what am I going to do about this pivy situation? How did she get into that mess? I got to figure out a way. No, he's not. He's sitting and he's still in perfect control of everything. Here's a really good moment for us as Christians, by the way. If you have any connections, any uh, relations with people that can voice the opinion which you hold in your heart concerning the word of God and these important matters of society, voice them. This is a moment when the church should shine brightest and the voice of the church should be the loudest to say we stand with Paivi. Unfortunately though, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, not the highest bishop, but one of the bishops in the church uh, wrote that uh, he, he disagrees with Pivey's view. He considers her views unbiblical, though he still says it, it, she should have the right to say the things. I mean, how can a bishop say it's unbiblical? And she said, thank, she said, I mean, I'm not quoting now. She wrote back something like, you know, <coughs> thanks for the support in that, in that area of free speech. But please explain, where am I unbiblical? It's like, yes, man, this woman is awesome. That's so just praise God for such people. But let's not make a Uzziah out of her. We have to focus on the Lord. We have to pray for her. We have to pray for her. Because I've said myself, like, man, 
we need more Pai Virasanans in this country. And it's true, yes, but l l let's just look to the Lord, right? I mean, we can make Uzziahs out of her as well. So, but the Lord is in control. He sees the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up. You know, he's not drooped over like I am so often, wondering what's going to happen. He's high and lifted up, glorified. His train filled the temple. Um, and above it stood the seraphims, each one having six wings. Now these, these closely represent the living creatures in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. I'll let you do the comparison on your own. It's an interesting thing. I don't think they're the same kind of spiritual being, but they are literal beings. This isn't figurative. This is an actual occurrence. Seraphims are a class, I believe, of angel different from the cherubim. Um, I believe they're a higher class of angel than the cherubim, and I don't even know if you can call them angels. I don't even know if they're a different kind of created being uh, or if they're actually just a high-ranking kind of angel. Seraphim, the word, means burning ones. Um, which is a fascinating uh, thing because you, you, you look at this burning one who needs to use tongs to pick up a coal when he himself is burning. So uh, it's just an interesting thing. Here they are, though. They have six wings each. And with two, they're, they're covering their face, their eyes. With two, they're covering their feet. And with two, they did fly. And so it tells us something interesting about them, that they are holy creatures. No doubt they're angels in heaven, um, which means they're free from the, the, the bondage of sin that, that um, you know, we need freedom from. Uh, the, there's, they stand in God's presence for all eternity. They are not pa part of the fallen uh, group of fallen angels. They're holy, they're perfect, and yet still... They bow before God in humility. They have to cover their face. It just makes you think if, if these holy creatures feel as if, you know, and, and you think also your, the feet, it's kind of an undesirable thing to look upon perhaps, and they want to cover anything maybe unpleasant before the Lord. They want to cover their face and they want to cover, it's, it's almost as if standing before the holiness of God, though they are perfect, they feel somehow unclean. They aren't unclean because they're perfect. They don't have sin. They don't, they don't need the blood of Christ to cleanse them and redeem them. Yet they somehow humble themselves and recognize that, that where they are compared to God's holiness is they're so far down the line. You can't make the comparison. So they cover their face, they cover their feet, and they fly. I like what Matthew Henry was saying about the flying is that they go about their business with rapidity with quickness, with eagerness, with zeal. They don't trot or plod, they fly to do the Lord's bidding. And, and it should show even in the hardest of tasks that God calls us to, we should go with expedition in our feet, with excitement, with eagerness to do what God has called us because we're doing his bidding. That should be our joy. Not, not, not what's in the task or what fruit might come out of the task, but because we're doing what he asked. That should be our joy. And so they worship the Lord with faces covered. They worship the Lord in humility. And they go before this throne, this great throne, where the Holy One of Israel is seated in a resting position. And of course, this throne is a throne of glory. And that's why they worship before it. That's why they bow before him. This throne is a throne of government, government, and they are subject to the government of God. So they bow before God in that throne, and it is also a throne of grace. We know all of these things about God's throne. It's a throne of glory, of government, and grace. And we praise him for that. He's in absolute control, and yet he's also good and gracious, and he's absolutely holy. And that's what they exclaim. Look at what it says in verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of glory. They, they, they cover their faces. Interestingly enough, um, in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle says this, But we all, but we all, 
with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. Isn't that interesting? I, I like that. That though we need to understand that if these angels, as perfect as they were, humbled themselves before God, and we need to reverence the Lord, fear the Lord, pay him the respect that's due to his name, and bow before him as such, yet we go to him as a child would go to his father with open face, saying, Abba, Daddy. And that there's just such an interesting paradox there. Because though he's completely holy, and in his presence we would all be consumed in a moment, yet at the same time he receives us when we go to him. And he even encourages us to boldly come to his throne of grace. Not timidly, but boldly. And we can do that because we go as one of his sons or daughters. Because in Christ we have been given the right or the power to become his son or daughter. And we do it on his merits. On the work of Christ we go. And so we boldly approach and with open face. With open face. We don't don't go timid and shy like these seraphim do. So we, we almost have, we enjoy a greater privilege and blessing and honor than these seraphim do. Because we are called sons and daughters. And we can boldly go. And with open face, we fellowship with God. Of course, I'm not saying we see him with our eyes, as it says clearly in that verse. With, you know, with open face, beholding as in a glass. In other words, it's, it, we don't see. It's through something at this moment. At this moment. Yet we go nonetheless with openness, without hiding. It's beautiful. With fear, with respect, but with openness. And, of course, they cried, holy, holy, holy. Um, and, and this, is, this is wonderful, of course. Uh, why do they repeat it three times? Well, perhaps they were wanting words. How can you express the holiness of God? How can you express what you see in the presence of God, in praise of God, in, in worship to him? How can you have enough words? And so you're, you're wanting words. So they repeat it again and again and again, perhaps. And also they exclaim, he's the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. So they also have some other words there too. But they love to center their praise and focus their attention on the holiness of God. They dwell upon it. If I may say, they they harp upon it. And they loathe to leave that focus. So they don't. They focus on the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy. Maybe to exclaim he is not just holy, but he's thrice holy. He's he's altogether holy. He is completely and utterly, originally and eternally and perfectly holy. But also it could be, it very well could be a direct reference to the Trinity. Holy God the Father, Holy God the Son, and Holy God the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. And, and why is that? Well, is that just because, well, there's, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and there's one holy, two holy, three holy? Not necessarily, because we have even in the context something that would allude to it. Look down in verse 8. What is the question that God asks? Whom shall I send and whom will go for us. It's one of those times when you see the mystery of the Trinity in Scripture, similar to Genesis chapter 1, where God exclaims, let us make man in our image. The Godhead conversing amongst themselves, if I could say it like that. Amongst himself is better said. It's fabulous. The Lord of hosts he is the Lord of their hosts, as you know, the seraphim are exclaiming. They recognize God as the commander-in-chief over the myriads and myriads of angels that are in heaven. But they also acknowledge he's the Lord of all hosts. He's the Lord over every host. He's the Almighty. 
And yet, he is holy. And that's wonderful because power without purity, to guide it, would be just an utter terror. And so we see God, just this beautiful, incredible, perfect being, absolutely right in all of the ways he uses his might. He's holy, and he's all-powerful. He is almighty. And then he manifests himself in this way to everyone, as it says here, that the whole earth is full of his glory. And we see the Lord. It, it sounds strange. I mean, for Isaiah even to say this and, and kind of recognize what was happening before him and repeat it so that we could read what was, what was being said by the seraphim and such, it sounds an odd thing to say that the whole earth is full of God's glory when so much sin and darkness and wickedness and so on and so forth is happening in this time and, of course, our, in our time as well. But nevertheless, that is the truth. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Because he is still on the throne. Nothing has deposed him. He is still perfectly enthroned and in charge and in control of every host and being imaginable. And the posts of the door, verse 4, moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then Isaiah spoke. He said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He exclaims a woe now upon himself. Did you get that? Remember, chapter 5, six woes he exclaimed upon the nation. Now he's not pointing the finger at anybody but himself. And I'm not saying, I, I don't know, again, if, if Isaiah's... If Isaiah's uh, first five chapters were, were more of a preface that he wrote later in his life and tagged on to the, to the beginning of his, of his you know, letter. These chapters weren't necessarily written in con, you know, chronological as, the, as it was happening is what I'm saying. Um, then this very well could have happened before all of those woes that were pr pronounced in Isaiah's day upon the nation. And I believe rightfully so, because before it can be we, it has to be me. Sounds funny to say it, but that's the truth. God must work in me before he can use me to reach the we. He has to make himself real to me, and I must respond to him in repentance and faith first. The work must be done in me and then through me. And then through me. That's how God works. And, and this is the moment when Isaiah was confronted with his own sinfulness. And how did that come about? Because he saw the Lord. It's amazing, isn't it? Because we have so many people in our day and age that claim they see the Lord. And what do they do with it? They don't exclaim their own sinfulness. They go and sell it. They put it on a DVD or a tape or a download this file or that file and they rake you over the coals for the money in your pocket. Because after all, I saw the Lord. Don't you want to hear what it was like? Let me tell you, but first you have to pay this or that or come to my conference and pay a crazy fee to get in and I'll tell you. No way. If you saw the Lord like Paul, you wouldn't even dare try to put it into words. you would at most exclaim, man, I, I, I think I had a vision of the Lord and I feel, I, I feel like I need to go and repent. <laughs> I feel dirty. I need to go to him and be cleaned. <laughs> this is what happened to Isaiah. As consecrated as he was as a man before this moment, suddenly he realized, I am just as bad as anyone. So I can't just point the finger and woe, woe, woe at the nation. It's, it's first, Lord, woe is me. Woe is me. And God opened the heart of the prophet in this very moment. He exclaimed, woe, right? So there we see the upward look. He's looking up to God. He, he sees the Lord and he exclaims, woe. Then he pronounces his confession to the Lord in prayer. I, Lord, I am undone. I am broken at my sin right now. I am come apart at the seams. I am a man of unclean lips. How could I 
get away with seeing you and live? How can I have such a privilege to be in your presence as I, as I have experienced and, and survive this? Lord, please have mercy on me. I confess my sinful. My, I'm a man of unclean lips. It's not that he had, you know, just eaten a burger and he didn't have a napkin. He, he literally was confessing his sin, and this is an expression of sinfulness. And also, notice, he's identifying with the sins that he has been rebuking as an individual. He's saying, I am just as bad as everybody, and I am just as in need as anybody. Lord, save me. As I've been praying for you to save this person and that person and so on, Lord, cleanse me, save me, revive me. It's so important. He presents himself before the Lord in this upward look, and then he, he kind of goes before the Lord in confession, and he talks to the Lord about his sin, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, he says, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. An interesting thing that he mentions the altar. He talks about the, the word temples used earlier in the chapter, if you noticed. Um, so some feel as if this is in the temple that this happens, but I, I don't know. We don't know where this took place. Though the temple and also before the temple, the tabernacle were supposed to be an exact replica according to what God showed Moses on the mount. Exodus chapter 25 verse 40 tells us and also Hebrews chapter 8. So you, you know what we can make from that is God gave Moses a pattern. Literally it says that in scripture. A pattern is something that is made from something else that exists. So What's, what's the layout of God's throne room in heaven? It becomes the tabernacle here on earth. That's the idea, which is a very, that's why, that's exactly why God was very specific in telling Moses, you must make it exactly according to the pattern that you saw up on the mount. And then it's reiterated to us in, in the book of Hebrews. So where did this exactly take place, this vision of the Lord? I don't know. Was it actually in the temple? Perhaps. It might not have been, it might, might have just been, you know, God brought him before his throne. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know how it happened, all the details, but anyway, interesting to think about those things. This seraphim, after the confession of Isaiah, nonetheless, takes a coal, brings it to Isaiah. Verse 7 then says, he laid it upon my mouth and then said, the seraphim says this, lo, or that's my translation, but behold, behold. This is beautiful. This hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. You're cleansed. You confessed it. You forsook it. You gave it to the Lord, and the Lord is merciful. The Lord has cleansed you. And it's, there's an exclamation. Behold. Behold this moment. Enjoy it. Be free. Confession brings liberation. And so the, the seraphim, even though he didn't need to confess sin ever, nor did he need to be cleansed of sin ever, yet he himself is amazed by it and says, Behold, this dirty thing is going to be made clean. God's going to clean him. God's going to wipe away his iniquity. God's going to be merciful. God's going to be gracious. And I believe that's what all the angels say about us as they behold us. Ephesians talks about this. They, they learn through the church, by observing us, the church, what grace is, because they don't need grace. They don't need redemption. They had never failed or falled. The fallen angels fell, but they're never going to be redeemed. Hell was created for them. The angels in heaven, they're, they're, they're pure, they're perfect. So how can God teach his holy angels about one of his most amazing attributes, that he's gracious or that he's merciful? by expressing that grace and mercy upon unworthy people like us and like Isaiah. As we go to him in confession and repentance, and then we receive the grace that he extends to us and cleanses us of our iniquity, then it goes on in verse 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go. He didn't say, No. <laughs> you, you know, I know you just had a moment with me, Isaiah, but, you know, come on. Get off your high horse. You're not ready for this. God says, okay, go. It's amazing. 
Did you notice those words? I like them. You have to circle them. If you have a King James Bible, you have to circle them. If you, if you don't, then you could have a boring translation or whatever. Uh, woe, verse 5. Verse 7, lo. And verse 9, go. Woe, lo, go. And we all need a woe, and we all need a lo, and we all need a go. I like this. God, God says this to us, you know, will you go? Who will go for us? Who will we send? It's amazing, isn't it? God, he's the Lord of hosts. He's seated on his throne. He's in perfect control. And yet he says, I want to use you. Will you go for me? I don't need you, but I want to use you. I can't help but think of how many times I've not responded to the call of God in my life. Where I've felt him maybe tugging, or I've even been invited to go somewhere and share or preach or what have you, and for one reason or another, I'll turn it down. God's just looking for the willing heart. You know, the greatest ability in you and me is availability. You don't need amazing abilities and talent. You just need to be available to the Lord. As he's shown you your sinfulness, as he's revealed himself to you, and you respond in that humility that Isaiah had, and you confess your sins, and then he cleanses you, and now he wants to use you. He's worked in you, now he wants to work through you, and he says, who will go? Just lift your hand and say, I will. Maybe as scared as you are, just say, I'll, I'll do it. I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm going to go. And then God will say to you, go. Go ahead then. Go on. And when God says go to you, it means he's going with you. The Lord of hosts goes with you. That's beautiful. It's encouraging. Go. And notice, now he, he gets his specific task. Tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. And basically God speaks forth a judgment. This is, this is, this is a judgment that God is going to work out in his people that that it's the the time is past i've i've warned them long enough i've sent them word enough they haven't responded and now even even though i'm going to continue to send word to them i am going to confirm their decision to reject me and i'm going to let their hearts be hardened it's just gone to that point where god he, he he just has let that go and so he says to Isaiah, so now, okay, I will go for you, Lord. And God says, go, and this is what you're to do. You're supposed to speak to people who won't listen to you. That's your ministry, okay? Really? Uh, can I pray about it, Lord? <laughs> Why didn't you tell me before I said I'd go, Lord? <laughs> oh, man. So maybe you could add... With the woe, lo, and go, no. <laughs> it's good to know what God calls you to. <laughs> but notice God calls him to a stiff-necked people, a people that won't listen, won't respond, won't receive. Isaiah, your words, the, the, words, the very words that I'm giving you to say are going to fall on deaf ears. But nevertheless, go for me. And Isaiah is still willing. Notice, he's a little bit, he's a little bit, maybe he shows some timidity in verse 11. Then said I to the Lord, how long do I have to do that for? <laughs> you see that? Really, Lord, how long? <laughs> oh, man. Is like this weekend or <laughs> forever? <laughs> and, you know, it's, God says, until, un, until the work of judgment is, is completed, until they're removed off the land. So as long as there's people to preach to in the land, your calling is still in effect. And they will just reject, and they will persecute, and they will not receive. But God then gives this gracious word at the very end, doesn't he? But there's going to be a remnant. There's going to be a remnant, and they're going to come back. So your preaching isn't in vain. It's not in vain. 
it's, it's going to affect some there is going to be a faithful remnant that will hear, that will respond. But the, the general consensus is going to be rejection. That isn't our concern, though, is it? The amount of fruit is not our concern. What God calls us to do is what our concern needs to be. What comes of that isn't our concern. That's his. What he does with our services is, is, is up to him. If he lets our service to be forever forgotten and lost in obscurity to all on this planet but him, we are okay with that. We are okay because he called us. We are at the service and pleasure of our king. That's how we live. That must be how we live because otherwise when you're sent to minister and your words and your ministry falls on hard hearts and deaf ears and ungrateful and even spiteful and hurtful people, you'll give up. You'll give in. You'll, you'll take the hand off the plow. You'll start looking like this and like that. And what other things can I do with my life? This has been hard. I don't want to, you know, I don't know. But the person who sets his hand to the plow is told not to look back, right? So if you've grabbed that plow, don't look back. Don't look back. We know what happened to one such character who looked back in the Bible, right? Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt. Be one salty character if you're looking back because you're going to be thinking there's something better over here, something better over there. Just buckle down, be faithful where you are to what God has called you. He will bless you there. No matter if no one responds or not, it doesn't matter. You give that to, to God. So there's the woe, low, go. There's the upward look, the inward look, and then the outward look. There's confession, cleansing, and commission. There's the height, there's the depth, and then there's the breadth. All these beautiful things that Isaiah experienced, which we all need to experience. Amen? Lord, we thank you for this, your word. As we close our time of your studying your word uh, in prayer, Lord, we go into a time of maybe a little bit prolonged time of prayer, Lord, we want to open it up with a full recognition and acknowledgement that you are holy. We exclaim, even as the seraphim exclaim, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, the whole earth is full of your glory. We worship you, we praise you, we adore you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We love you and we thank you that you are seated firmly upon your throne. And there is none higher than you. And Lord, we thank you that there is something that you cannot see. And that is an equal. You cannot see a peer. Because there is none equal to you. There is none as great as you. And we are thankful that you are our Father. And you are our Redeemer. And you are the giver of life. You are our sustainer, our helper, our comfort, our rest, our peace. Lord, you are the one who has gone to prepare a place for us. You are the one who has promised to come and receive us unto yourself, that where you are, we may be also. Lord, we praise you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done on the cross for us. We acknowledge who you are. We fully we fully reverence you, Lord, because you are worthy of our reverence and our fear, our respect, our honor, and our awe. You are awesome, and you are great and greatly to be praised, and we praise you for who you are. We give you this time now. We ask by your Spirit you'd lead us in prayer. We confess to you, Lord, we are weak, and we stand at your mercy. We confess to you also, Lord, that maybe we look to man a bit too much. We have some Uzziahs in our life or maybe some famous commentators or preachers or, or, or pastors or even friends or family members who love you and they're wonderful people, but Lord, they aren't to replace you ever. Lord, you are the one we are to keep our eyes fixed on. And so help us, Lord, to, to lay aside our Uzziahs and to see you. And Lord, cleanse us. Cleanse us, Lord, that we might be pure, clean, open vessels for you to flow through freely. 
and thereby commissioning us, Lord, to do your work, to do your bidding. And Lord, when the hard times come, let us just remember that vision of you. You are seated on the throne, high and lifted up. We praise you, Jesus.